Look for natural gas in a new oil price reality. Uh, it's a session that um, was particularly uh, uh, crafted by His Excellency the Minister, who was uh, very keen that natural gas uh, feature in the forum today, in which we uh, may also be, obviously, where oil is, is very much center stage, but the implications of all of this for natural gas is, is very important, uh, as we can all appreciate, and, um, and very much connected. We've seen uh, the LNG prices into Asia drop 50% over the last 12 months. Clearly, that's significant if you're an LNG producer, and if you're Japan or China, as we heard this morning, you're dancing in the streets. Um, so if we might just start the session by bringing up the first survey question to get everybody involved before I introduce the panel. Uh, and the first question is, is, is a fairly simple one uh, to get a sense of the most sort of recent developments in, uh, in, 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 in the, the gas subject, uh, and that is the idea that LNG coming out of the US until very recently was going to be the biggest game changer. Um, so the oil price collapse has more than halved. Henry Hub linked natural gas contract price advantage over oil link supplies from Qatar and elsewhere, which means US LNG export plans won't materialize any time soon. Do you agree? Yes or no? I.e., will this development derail plans that LNG coming out of the U.S. will go to Asia. Uh, so, anytime soon. Don't expect renewal. Yes, expect what's, renewal. What's, what's renewal? Well, what's what's <laughs> being renewed? That's uh, the wrong edition of the question. Uh, <laughs> the don't. So I would I would translate that to be number one is. Uh, no, uh, that it won't <laughs> affect. And number two is yes, that it will uh, impact the uh, LNG export. So one, no, two, yes. Yes, it will impact. Number one, it won't. So vote now, 10 seconds, please. It wasn't long ago that uh, we were sending, Qatar was building an LNG regasification plant in the US, and now it's not. Ooh, so not so big a difference there. Um, regardless of the answer, <laughs> there's still a 50-50 uh, uh, response. So it's uh, certainly, I think, a, uh, a subject in which our, I might start then with giving that answer with John Roper, the head of Middle East for Eon Global Commodities, who uh, your company has been involved in, in looking at the U.S. for possible gas. Uh, you've been fighting oil index pricing for a number of years with the Russians. Where do you see this going now and the impact for gas? Um, you've got the first tranche of, uh, of U.S. Uh, tolling projects that are uh, currently under construction. That's about 42 uh, million tons of LNG a year that is going to be coming into the marketplace in about 2018, 2019. So um, I voted no. I don't see that it's going to have an effect um, on those projects. Um, of course, it has an effect on the, on the absolute price. Um, but I think it's not just price that people look at. One thing that these US projects um, offer consumers of LNG is, uh, is diversity. Um, so you have a diversity both in a pricing scenario and also a geographical scenario. Um, and, and certainly uh, Asian buyers um, have been very grateful of being given that uh, uh, opportunity to diversify away from uh, historical uh, contracts and historical producers. So um, 
I don't really see that uh, um, uh, the, the current lowering uh, of the differential is going to make um, a huge immediate uh, difference. What about the competitiveness of that LNG if it does come out of the US that was expected to possibly underprice uh, LNG coming out of this region into Asia and so offer uh, Asia a better... No, I, I, certainly you're going to see, I mean, you, you're already seeing um, uh, JCC prices and, and hub prices getting closer together. So it, it is going to make uh, less of a margin. Um, and so there will be, you know, for a period of time, a perception uh, of less competitiveness. But there was always a perception that um, Henry Hub linked uh, LNG was going to be cheap LNG, but that was uh, shown to be a, a bit of a fallacy. Um, you know, now in a lower oil price environment, we have a lower priced uh, LNG project, uh, product rather, uh, uh, across the board. So I still see it as competitive. Um, and I think you just have to look at uh, uh, the context of how much is actually being developed uh, and how much has actually already been sold. So, I might just bring now in Mr. Musabe El Kabi, Chief Executive Officer of Bubadla Petroleum. Your chairman and minister said this morning that uh, it, 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 it's not a nice to have to have companies like Mubadala going internationally, but a, a must have in a sense to compete and bring your expertise to other markets. I know you are looking at the likes of East Africa and elsewhere. How does that, this development vis-a-vis -vis your procurement of gas supplies, uh, gas opportunities in other markets change now with this new profile? Uh, as a Mubadala Petroleum, we're uh, very active in the local ga uh, gas supplies. As we speak, we're uh, contributing a significant percentage of the current uh, supplies to the uh, UAE. That percentage will grow with time. Uh, we're uh, uh, moving on with a strategic uh, project, Emirates LNG. Hopefully, by end of this decade, we will have it operational. Uh, along with that, we have also interest to become uh, a company with, uh, uh, with a position in the LNG. Uh, recently, we've been evaluating many opportunities, uh, including uh, the, uh, the North America, but uh, the fundamentals are slightly changing. Uh, if you ask me last year, I would say yes, I'm confident. I would like to be in the US. It looks very promising uh, in terms of uh, future uh, L LNG supplies to the market here potentially also to the region. But uh, there is a degree of uncertainty at the moment in view of the recent drop in the oil prices. Uh, Mubadala Petroleum is, no, long, is no, no different than anyone else. We're also evaluating our options. But in the long term, we have a more uh, optimistic view on the oil price. And uh, uh, our decisions will be based on a strategic and long-term view. The, in the context of Emirates LNG, which is uh, in plans for importing uh, gas into Fujairah uh, for the UAE market, uh, how does a development, from a price point of view, versus the idea that also the UAE is exporting LNG to Japan, uh, is price relative, relevant in any way, the change of price to decisions around those two things? I think the price will uh, have a major issue, you know, when, when, we, when we go to the... Uh, and at the moment, we see our, our view on the LNG prices in the long term is, uh, is uh, more optimistic than what we had a year ago. Uh, price definitely is going to, to, uh, to be an issue. But for a country like UAE, uh, Indexing that to oil might be an, uh, a very interesting uh, concept uh, because it's, uh, uh, it's like a hedging. The high oil prices, you know, you're in the low oil prices, you're getting also the benefit. So, uh, yes, pricing will have an impact, but uh, yet that to be discussed in the, in the few years from now. If I'd like to now also bring in our, our third panelist, Dr. Alde Flores Caroga, Secretary General of the IEF, the International Energy Forum. Your views on, it's not so long ago that uh, demand for LNG was talked about moving into the US. 
uh, not coming out of the U.S. With the now that the, with the shale revolution and all of the domestic supply, uh, now we're, we're looking at the idea of it coming out and being an exporter. Uh, given the development in this oil price change, uh, could we see certain scenarios, of course, where America once again could be an importer? Wow. What a <laughs> uh, 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 no, things I, I, change, obviously. I, I don't see, for the time being, that, that scenario. It's, uh, all the projections are that uh, the United States will be consuming its, uh, its own gas, and, and uh, the importing scenario would, would require an expansion in power generation and, uh, and industry that uh, we have yet to, to see its trends in order to be confirmed. Um, we heard this morning about a, uh, the world's biggest, what was it, Toyota car making? or. BMW. BMW. BMW, even nicer maybe, but no. Uh, <laughs> but being produced in, in the, if the manufacturing wave we've seen in America, I mean, it's a scenarios on scenarios, but it's certainly on scenarios on scenarios that redirected it the other way, so. Yeah, but let me point something that I think is uh, important. Um, this, is, I mean, this is a very interesting question about how oil will be affecting gas, but to date, we've been focusing mainly on how coal and renewables will, will be affecting natural gas consumption. And uh, coal consumption increased in Europe, contrary to the trends of policy and the, and the desires of the European Commission. And in the US, after coal consumption had been decreasing precisely because of the switching to gas, it began to increase again. So I, I still think that uh, the main challenge to gas looking forward will be coal, and uh, it will be mainly about what's going on, what will happen in the power market. We don't know what will happen in terms of technology for transportation. So it's pretty much an equation about power generation and the possibilities of switching between renewables and coal, nuclear. I mean, so maybe. far I haven't heard from any of the panelists about whether the, this fairly significant development. Of course, we can debate how long it's going to last, and it's early in the journey. Uh, but if we're sitting here in a year's time and we're still at the current price structure, um, is, are we going to see new gas uh, geography, I mean, new gas patterns, new gas trading patterns, i.e., we were talking about importing into LNG, or LNG imports into the US, now we're talking about LNG exports. Uh, we, is there other, do we see any tra patterns that could change? I mean, do you see that at all or not? Well, even with the previous price environment, we didn't see, uh, despite the approvals and the, and the uh, applications for LNG export facilities in the US, much activity beyond one, uh, one LNG export plant, right? And we have the new investments coming on from Australia, probably East, uh, East Africa. It's not clear to me that it's going to be a very dynamic market in terms of uh, investment uh, for LNG exports unless Asian demand does really pick up much, much more. And that still will interact with what's going on with I mean, could we see, what about the, perhaps LNG out of Qatar being redirected? We were seeing LNG out of Qatar redirected from the US market, directed to Asia and Japan. John, your thoughts on that, could we see and each changes in those patterns? Well, More right. pipeline to UAE gas rather than? And it's, it's, it's difficult to speak on behalf of uh, Qatari marketing philosophy, but it's... Uh, well, just um, price and speculate. I think you see that anyway. Under the, under, in all of the Qatari contracts, the small print uh, allows both Qatar gas and Ras gas to uh, uh, redirect cargoes um, uh, if, they, uh, if the marketing committees have, a, have an alternative. So, uh, for instance, I um, mean, Lord Howe, uh, Gatar Gas puts a lot of cargoes on print anyway into the UK. And uh, last winter or the winter before last, uh, Gatar successfully kept the electricity generating uh, in the UK. But that's not always the case. And a lot of those cargoes, um, you know, do get diverted uh, from the UK. They don't I mean, turn if we up see, uh, South uh, Hook. The so. statistic that Lord Howe mentioned today about uh, the Japanese restarting their nuclear power plants and, and, and the demand for LNG d d decreases there. 
uh, then it, new trade patterns could emerge. Uh, that's some of the thinking, and I'd certainly welcome anybody in the audience's views on that. Uh, I'd like to introduce our fourth panelist, uh, Mr. Narendra Taneha, president of the World Energy Su Policy Summit from India and an advisor to the new Indian government on energy policy. How is India seeing this change? Obviously, you must be quite happy with the uh, new gas and oil price. Well, uh, yes, uh, very happy. But at the same time, we know that uh, we, you know, we're a large country, 1.26 billion people. That is and large. in a country like ours, where 700 million people are still living below energy poverty line. So we need, I also heard the debate in the morning, but I don't know, we look at hydrocarbon in a very different way. We need more oil, we need more gas, and we probably need more coal. So as far as India is concerned, hydrocarbon is a sunrise industry, and probably will remain sunrise uh, uh, industry for a very, very long time to come, because when you look at India's energy mix, 90% is fossil fuel, uh, coal, oil, and gas. And we don't think that is going to change over the next 20 years. We don't see that happening. What about biomass, have, is it? Pardon? Biomass? Biomass and renewable and solar and all that, but we, as I said, 700 million people are still kind of hydrocarbons have not. So in the world over, we have 1.6 billion people with no access to electricity. So these are totally different numbers, the way we look at it. For us, for instance, we need more gas. Simply, we are not even discussing the price at the moment. We just want our countries, our cities, our people. You know, we are a densely populated country, so we are actually moving for gas. Like, for instance, in many cities, we are making it now compulsory for people to switch to CNG for automobiles. We are not looking at the economics alone. We are looking at the economics of environment, economics of health of the people, and whatever the cost. So why do you want more hydrocarbons then? Well, simply because we need more hydrocarbon and we also need more renewable energy. We are investing $100 billion over the next four years in renewable energy alone, but that would not be sufficient. As we said that we have 700 million people living below energy poverty line. So we need everything. If you have some other source of energy, please share with us, and we need that too. <laughs> you know? so we I need have a bicycle that can... So we, so we need that too. You were talking about the U.S. In fact, on the contrary, we are signing agreements with the U.S. India's state-owned company called Gale India has entered into an agreement with the U.S. to import LNG. We are constructing seven LNG ships just to import LNG from the U.S. And that's also part of the idea is to, to basically diversify sources. We want to import LNG from wherever you can supply it to us, from including the Arctic. We are looking at the Arctic also very closely, together with the Russians, and hopefully with the start oil of Norway. So it's a completely, that's what I'm saying, when we discuss these things... So you're ready to, to, to pick up uh, any re-diverted cargoes that Japan gives up? Oh, absolutely. We are building at least four more LNG, LNG terminals in India. There are three private sector companies building three more LNG terminals. And I was just telling my friend, I said, why don't you come and invest in India? Please come. <laughs> what See, did he say? Well, uh, well <laughs> he said he, he has already started talking with the one Indian company called OVL, so ONGC Videsh. So in a country like ours, we look at the whole the thing, we look at the whole thing very differently. I've been listening to the debates this morning. But here we are conveniently forgetting. Even I don't want to comment on China because I'm not I'm, I'm not an expert. But I'm sure there are they need more energy than we think they need, and I'm sure the same with Africa. They probably the in, uh, India, Asia, and Africa put together. I mean, you you have got huge market for hydrocarbon. There is, of course, when people who don't have access to oil or natural gas, for us, debate is whether it's eco-friendly or not. For us, debate is why not renewable energy. For them, is any source of energy. That's the debate. 700 million people in India alone. I'm not, I don't know how many people in China. We don't know. What, so, ab what so, about so, any source of energy and the, and the premium, although no longer present perhaps, in the LNG price into Asia? Uh, it's not so long ago that the Asian buyers were Asian talking premium. about putting together a, a, a cartel in which to have an Asian buyers of LNG. What's well, these, these things can be handled differently. I mean, there is a track to initiative and I'm part of it that India, China, Korea, and Japan are trying to come together so that we can create our own importers cartel yeah. in order to negotiate with them so that we get better deals. There is an OPEC. Why, 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 why shouldn't there be OPEC? 
you know, organization of petroleum importing countries. Why, why and not? similarly, then there can be organization of gas importing countries. So uh, the world is changing. The world, I want to give you briefly one example. Yeah. Only once the word BRICS was mentioned in the morning. BRICS, look at the, there are five countries in BRICS. Brazil, South Africa, Russia, India, and China. Look at the BRICS composition. There are, two, ma yeah. there are two major oil consuming countries are in the BRICS, India and China and also gas consuming. And there are two major oil and gas producers in the break. There's Brazil, and hopefully Brazil will also grow big, but Russia, you see. So I think the world is changing. We are forgetting one thing, it's a new world, and that what the price, price, we are discussing price, but we are forgetting conveniently one aspect. The world is going through major structural changes in the way hydrocarbon businesses run. And out of this turmoil, call it terminal, call it by any name, after three years will emerge a new oil and gas world order. And their countries like India and China, Japan and Korea, or the big imports would also have a very, very significant say in a very organized manner. And that will be new world. So, sorry, Zaldo. I just want to say, comment on, on what Narendra is saying. In my interpretation of that is that um, there's structural factors that will be constant. Even, even though we're going into this transformation in the market, a lot of what Narendra is saying is that, look, what's going on, the way I understand it, the price situation right now is circumstantial, and what is going to be driving the market is the fact that you have a very large set of consumers in Asia that will still need the, the demand. And this is pretty consistent with what we've seen uh, throughout the last three decades. We have seen prices increase and decrease drastically, and uh, oil supply has been increasing about a million barrels per day every year. So I see no reason to think that uh, this is going to be in any way different and that the main drivers of decision-making for investment in gas markets will continue to be expectations about economic growth, population growth, and as I said, what will happen with power generation and uh, so the, technology the, the, for transportation. The, 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 the reduced prices, uh, you don't see any trend changing to the narrative. Asia remains the dominant consumer of hydrocarbons, gas or oil, coming out of this region or any region for that matter. At this stage with the information we have, I, I would be very surprised if Asia does not remain the main driver of these markets. So what about, I, I know you, you sort of went around it a little bit, but I'd like to come back to you on your views of East Africa and the development of uh, the resources out of East Africa at, in, the, in, in the coming period. Do you see it as uh, a, an increased incentive to go there? with the lower price uh, for gas, or, or what's the, your views on, on the development? What are East Africa facing now? Yeah, I think in East Africa, we all acknowledge it is a massive discovery, and sooner or later, someone will develop these resources. The issue we faced with, uh, uh, with that region is the cost associated with developing such resources. Massive, it could be another Qatar in, uh, in Africa, with the capacity to produce up to 70 uh, million ton per annum, but the cost associated with that is very, very high. Uh, two things will probably uh, redefine that region. If the cost comes down, and if the LNG outlook or prices outlook looks more optimistic than the currently oil-indexed uh, contract. Uh, but definitely, it's a region no one can ignore. It will emerge. Uh, the only debatable issue is at what cost and the timing. How, how big do you think uh, African will be a consumer and customer of its own uh, gas project? I mean, East Africa, yeah. with the biggest market for East African gas will be Africa, not China. I think in general it's, it will remain limited. Uh, I know the African countries are even discussing the concept of gas to liquid. GTL, and they had a pretty advanced discussion with some of the players of the GTL uh, in order to create a market in that part of the world. But overall, with the current projection of the economic growth of uh, certain countries, it might be uh, an issue to, uh, to consider a significant market share for that gas. Majority of that gas will be exported and um, I see also the point made by my friend here is after the discovery of East Africa gas resources, we saw a massive interest 
by the Asians, including our friends from uh, India. They made a big transaction, and they are part of that uh, project at the moment. Uh, I th uh, they made it uh, based on two, the resource, of course, and strategic supply uh, to their market in the future. You mentioned there that um, the outlook is also for East Africa is affected by whether the oil index gas price survives or, or, or returns. I'd like to go to the next question to the floor for voting, as that is the next question, and uh, as to how, what that outlook is, and maybe, Render, you could also comment on. Uh, hopefully there's no gremlins in this uh, question, and I'll read it off the wall rather than off my page so that they're aligned. Uh, an estimated 100 million tons per annum of new LNG capacity is set to hit the market between 2015 and 18, which will represent about a 35% expansion over last year's total capacity of 290 million tons per annum. Will this new LNG capacity trigger the end of the era of long-term natural gas supply agreements based on oil indexation? Agree or disagree? 10 seconds, please. Well, the answer is, is that this also depends on the region you're talking about, right? Well, let me ask you first, how did you vote so you can't budget? <laughs> I, I, think I saw you press the button. <laughs> I think it will take longer to see that type of uh, hub pricing in, in Asia, as much as there is a big push for it. Um, just because of the nature of, of the market, you need much more depth and infrastructure there. But I can see that type of movement. Well, it's already, we already have in North America. We see that type of movement in, in Europe. It's hard to think of something like that in other parts of the world. Uh, so I think it's. So, but do, does, it, does it matter if index or not now with the oil with the price so much lower? Do you think? I mean, you're a, technically a buyer and a seller of gas, but I know? think for a country like or some of the countries in the region where they. Uh, depend, I would say, significantly on oil revenues. Uh, indexing is, uh, is, in principle, might be not a bad idea. Uh, there certainly seem to be but, actively defending it in terms yeah. of the likes of the, the gas exporting countries forum uh, are set up nearly to protect against the delinking of uh, mm -hmm. those two uh, what about in India, Nandra? Is it well, an issue? You see the does two it make ways. a difference? Yeah, the two ways it does, because uh, we are also entering into some agreements which are where the you know, supply guarantee is more important than anything else. And at the same time, I think there is a very important element here. That it, if you look at the map of the Arabian Sea, Arabian Sea is India and then Iran and Middle East and then down to Mozambique. This area is emerging probably as probably the hottest area in terms of LNG and uh, you know, gas exports. Uh, and it will, of course, this factor, but the second very important factor is the security environment. What happened to the overall security environment in the Arabian Sea would play a very important role in what is going to be the price of natural gas. Because so far we haven't really seen much disruptions, but the way some of the people are actually acquiring uh, new technology, not only nations and corporations, some people who want to create disruption, they are also acquiring that technology, you know, and that capabilities. I think so. overall security environment would be very important for us in India, since we are moving aggressively mo for natural gas, whatever the price, I think the more than the price, the supply, uh, 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 you know, would be the most important factor here. But coming to this thing, what we still believe in India that... So you think there still will be a culture in Asia, including India, that security of supply will trump price. I mean, there will be a, a premium to pay for that. Secure supply, absolutely. John, is, you're uh, I was on the other side of that from a, as a private company. I mean, the, the Eon has been fighting to delink these two for a long time. Do you think the argument will be won? How did you vote in this? Um, I agreed because I think you can already see that it's happening. Um, and I, I think I mean, 100 you, million tons coming in the next few years. But I, I, you, you've had the Japanese and Koreans um, in the last sort of four or five years. 
um, last four years, not wanting to sign the extension to their historical long-term um, oil index agreements with the Qataris, for instance. Um, I think at the moment there are 19 different price reviews going on within Japanese companies and suppliers. Um, and no one is making a move to commit to a new term or a new price until those price review discussions have been had. So um, any, any contracts that have been signed in the last uh, two or three years, they've been either five-year terms or seven-year terms. I mean, one, one out of Japan has been a 12-year term. Um, you've seen uh, a mix of both Henry Hub and oil indexation, this, this new term of hybrid contract. However, um, about 70% of those contracts that, that have been signed are a mixture of oil indexation or a mixture of hybrid and oil, not, not Henry Hub um, uh, on its own. So, so that is already starting to happen because there has been huge pressure on um, governments, in this case in Japan and Korea, who have a very, very large uh, uh, energy bill. When, when you bring in another 290 million tons, if it is going to be that much, um, it's going to add further uh, pressure uh, for the producers and, and, and the, the buyers are going to have um, more time to negotiate for the type of terms that they need. I mean, I think you'll end up seeing spot uh, cargoes disappearing because the term of contracts could easily come down to two-year, three-year uh, terms, which governments are going to be happy with, which companies are going to be happy with, uh, because they'll have a, a, a view on their forward curve of pricing. Um, could, we, could we bring so, a microphone to the front table here, Mr. Zhu? I'd, be, I'd like to welcome your thoughts from uh, China on the, um, this oil index issue and also the impact currently on the gas markets. Where is China's view on fighting oil index? Again, as, uh, as this morning I mentioned, this uh, cheaper oil should be uh, uh, good news for bigger consumers, you know. But uh, at the same time, uh, for China, it's still facing some other issues how to adjust uh, their uh, consumption structure to dealing with the low price. As uh, uh, the gentleman from, from, from India said, you know, uh, it's a big country like China and India, they need all types of energies, not only for oil and gas alone, right? For China and India, very much dominated energy mix and dom dominated by the coal, you know. Coal is cheaper and also help find the coal as a uh, cleaner coal as uh, a solution for the, uh, in the, uh, optimizing the energy mix. This is a huge task for us. So now we have to think that the low price is a good thing for import. And also is another challenge for our, to restructure our strategy as well. And for the impact on the natural gas, this is another thing. I really recognize that globally speaking, now China really in a good position to dealing with a lot of the natural gas supplies. You know. Um, in good thing, in 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 positive side, uh, I I will believe China is very really much to uh, to balance the import by the pipeline and the ANG because of some uh, oil index the ANG import got a uh, huge pressure, right, and get China a good position to renegotiate uh, with some. MG exporters. At the same time, they got a good position to negotiate with other gas exporters by the pipeline. That will be a very good position for China to deal with. We saw recently that China downgraded the uh, outlook for shale gas in China. Uh, why was that and what impact did the change? Actually, shale gas is increased unexpectedly. This is another good news as well. Especially, we have a big uh, discoveries in the southwest, uh, south, uh, southwest part of China, the Sichuan Basin. So, uh, shale gas production from there is going much higher than our expected. Absolutely, we can meet and even overtake the, our tasks for the year 2015 and even 2020. That will be a good news for us. But the cost is another thing, you know. Does the so, current cost change the outlook for developing shale gas in China? 
Uh, cost is the one thing, uh, but I don't think will be changing its uh, outlook for the natural gas, including shale gas, into the year 2020. And now there's another thing I would like to mention is the gap of uh, uh, the price between domestic price and the import price is narrow, quite narrow down. This is give us a good uh, time window to reform our natural gas price at home. So it has it narrowed recently with the change of the international market price for LNG. Mm -hmm. Then we will have you know uh, a good time to to reform our, our natural gas price format at home. What is the and it will be increase yes, to uh, diversify the the natural gas supplies. What is the outlook in China regarding Russia being uh, increasing its supply to? China, and what is the, the, the view on the price of the agreement with Russia now? Because it, at the time, it seemed the price Yes, again, was cheap. Since because we have a multiple source available now, you know. Once Russia facing east to negotiate, go back to negotiate from China is, uh, for the gas deal, that is a long-lasting gas deal. You know, uh, simply because of the big debate on the gas format, we cannot reach agreement. But uh, over the time, when we have multiple source available, and especially uh, natural gas available from Central Asia, that raises a great pressure on Russia. And also, Russia needs to diversify its uh, gas export as well. That is a good time for negotiate, renegotiate with them, and the price will be good for China. <laughs> A lot really of things are China. coming in your, in your direction. <laughs> Any questions for the panel, uh, comments, please put up your hands and uh, we will, uh, yep, please, Lord Howell, yep. Uh, just to add a, a, a European dimension to the gas issue, uh, uh, I agree totally with Mr. Tanesha that things are changing fundamentally. And until recently, uh, the European authorities were putting their shirt on um, uh, uh, re renewable energies on the assumption that fossil fuels would get more expensive and renewable energies would be the future, I mean, particularly energy of Inda in Germany and also policy in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Um, and then and there was a general hostility to all fossil fuels. And then, of course, along came Ukraine, Crimea annexation, um, more hostility towards Russia, and that to totally changed the view. And suddenly gas became the thing. And where was Europe going to get a gas from if Gazprom was going to be increasingly awkward, um, not merely cutting off through Ukraine, but being positively hostile through its energy supplies. Is so Europe, there's, is been Europe great, there's been a great move towards um, thinking about where we get, where Europe gets its gas from now. And suddenly gas has become the favoured thing. And everyone is talking about building uh, Poland and uh, I think Lithuania, building new LNG plants, importing plants. Uh, everyone is looking to the big world suppliers of some hopes from America, although it probably will be just as expensive. Um, the whole mode has changed towards gas. In fact, this is an exaggeration because the truth is that there are only one or two smaller countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe that depend totally on Russia. And that's obviously an unwise thing. They've got to reduce their... Estonia is 100% on Russia. They've obviously got to bring their dependence down. But in the future, the truth is that although Gazprom will not be in such a strong monopoly position, they may have to bargain more against um, other suppliers to Europe, uh, there'll still be lots of Russian gas. Is through. there any... What is your thoughts on the, 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 the general narrative that is that the Middle East can become a gas supplier to Europe, uh, either by more LNG or by pipeline, which has to cross so well, many borders. Well, I mean, Europe will be looking all sorts of places. Of, obviously, the Caspian and the uh, possibilities. I've even heard a suggestion that, that the ill-fated Nabucco might be revived now that South Stream has been closed down. Or, and Putin had to say that we can't go ahead with that. So... Um, we're looking at the Caspian. I think we look at the East Mediterranean, maybe, although it looks very expensive the, to get the gas out there, although Israel is already doing it. Um, and yes, uh, to the Middle East and to 
uh, a market that is moving, and this is where I'd love to hear the expertise of other, an LNG market that is moving global. And once it becomes global, we'll draw uh, LNG from wherever we can get it. Certainly in, in my country, in Britain, we think we're very favorably placed. The Norwegians want to supply more to us by pipeline. Even the Russians are trying to pipeline to, to uh, East Anglia. I don't think they're very popular at the moment. But um, uh, everyone is ready to supply us with more pipeline gas. Everyone's ready to supply us with more LNG. We've got ships queuing up. When you say LNG problem. going global, you mean not in long-term contracts? Not in long-term contracts, that's right, yes. Very much more playing, playing the market and going where we can. That, that, that will only happen. happen when there are uh, more uh, independently owned tankers. So, Ali, uh, I've got a question to you. Um, does Adnatco have any, any plans to sort of put together uh, an LNG tanker fleet? Because liquidity uh, for the LNG business um, is paramount as, as it is in the crude business. And if you don't have that, then you're not going to have the scenario that Lord Howell is talking about. I know it's to make you smile, but... Uh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, putting LNG tankers, it has to be coincided with uh, a specific project. So maybe I'm not the right person to answer this uh, question, but if the question to me, I'm not putting any expansion in our LNG uh, vessels because they are sufficient enough to exercise the project meant to be for. So that's my answer. And, and that just highlights the problem. At the moment, within the industry, um, you have a project, you have LNG tankers that service that project, ostensibly for the life of the finance of the project. Let, let, we haven't let, got to that marketplace yet. Uh, let me just share with you that uh, there are so many LNG vessels are available. Yeah. So I just uh, looked at the market, and uh, there are so many available in the market that could be chartered by anybody. Yes, that could be, uh, yeah. but the, the company ownership hasn't yet got to that, uh, that that's, stage. That's yes, another that's story. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Aldo? Just, I just would like to emphasize again that uh, this is interactive with, with, with prices. Uh, the fate of gas in, in Europe, of course, had to do with these geopolitical events and the like. And, uh, despite, but despite the best uh, intentions of policymakers, policy could not, uh, uh, in terms of promoting renewables or cleaner sources of energy, could not trump the structural fundamental market factors that made coal more attractive, despite all this uh, support. So in, in some ways, Europe still has many options in terms of fuel switching. Uh, uh, should the situation be that uh, gas becomes uh, more difficult to access, right? And uh, Europe has a resistance to coal and to nuclear for environmental reasons. Uh, other continents don't, but these are still options. To me, the main challenge to gas will continue to be uh, coal and, uh, and, and, well, of course, whatever happens in terms of some major technological advance with renewables. Uh, no, under just a small point. I think yeah, I agree with you, uh, uh, you know, but at the same time, I think coal probably would be used more for power, power generation. But when it comes to transportation, and captive power plants, I think you will see gas, for this the trend's happening. And also, it will depend a lot on, like you talked about LNG ships, I think there the scene is going to change very soon, because as countries like India you start, they move in the direction of constructing their own LNG ship. In India now it has been made compulsory, mandatory, that if you're importing, at least one third of those ships must be constructed in India. That's the government policy now, which, was, which came out just two weeks ago. So I think that would fundamentally change What about change pipeline the versus shipping? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the pipeline gas versus shipping. I mean, the, well, we're you see a pipeline from Russia to China. Uh -huh. Yeah, I go back to the same thing. You see, uh, uh, when you look at big markets like India, we need everything, including pipelines. But right now, when you look at the geopolitical environment around India, it's not very conducive for building pipelines. I think it may change, maybe seven years, ten years. We are all watching what happened in Afghanistan. If Afghanistan becomes more stable, I think you will see three or four pipelines into India from Central Asia and even Russia. But it all depends on the security environment. Right now, we are all very closely watching what happens in Afghanistan. In my personal view, I mean, oil and gas industry is going through fundamental changes, fundamental structural changes. And I think Afghanistan is one area which we need to watch very closely when it comes to oil and gas business throughout Asia. And Asia will basically be the gravity center of oil and gas for the next 30 years. Africa, this century belongs to Africa, we all know that. But that is all the second half of this century. Even for oil and gas, Africa will be big boy in 
oil and gas, but that's again 2050 and beyond when countries like India and China would basically find other sources of energy and would be investing more on in nuclear, renewable, and all that. So I think only that will happen. Until then, is going to be Asia. And second, how what happens in the Middle East will decide basically the price of the way we look at it. It's all about geopolitical stability in, in, in the Middle East. We personally consider in India, demand and supply is playing a big role, but geopolitics of the Middle East is one thing that keeps us- Well, if you take the last 40 years of geopolitics of this region and take that as a guide for the next 40 years, do you, are you, does that look positive for the realization of all the energy needs? Well, well, the last 40 years were very different, but the next 40 years, especially next 20 years for the Middle East, are going to be extremely challenging. As Ali said in one of the sessions in the morning, it's, it's not about only Palestine. It's about the aspirations of the Facebook and the Twitter class. And they want Middle East to be just like any other part of the world, like China, Europe, America, and Canada. Can the leadership here deliver that? If not, countries like India would be having sleepless nights because we are so heavily dependent on oil and gas from the Middle East. So it's in our own interest that Middle East actually develops into a more stable region because otherwise it will hamper the economic growth of countries like India as well. Musabe, would, would UAE invest or be interested in more pipeline gas, uh, with, given this <coughs> unstable neighborhood Narendra is concerned about, is, is that uh, rather than investing in LNG? I know you would like more from Qatar, perhaps, <laughs> but uh, some might become available. Yeah. I think one strategic uh, view of the country is to have enough optionality and flexibility. As we speak, we have uh, a pipeline linking uh, Qatar to UAE. We have also another pipeline linking UAE and Oman. Initially, we imported gas from Oman. Now we're exporting gas to Oman. And there is another pipeline that is not functioning. It is the Iranian Sharjah uh, pipeline that is linking UAE with, uh, with Iran. So I think we have enough flexibility in terms of pipeline, but uh, as a strategic uh, uh, direction by the government is to have more optionality and that's why we expand on the LNG so uh, I th uh, in Dubai they're uh, expanding or uh, upgrading their uh, facilities. The LNG facility now in Vajera will be a permanent fixed facility not yeah. offshore. Yeah. Yes so ultimately the, gov uh, the government and the country uh, would have enough flexibility in the future uh, when it comes to gas pipeline or and would you look for that facility like was mentioned a long-term supply arrangement or will you look for spot to fill at, that at, at the moment it's still under uh, assessment okay uh, probably a combination of two might be a compromise okay chances for last final <coughs> comments questions uh, from the floor we'll go to the uh, last question on the on the wall um, the, how will the Middle East LNG exporters be impacted over the next decade by the emergence of significant competition as Asian consumers source more gas from Australasia, US, and East Africa? Uh, Qatar will have to redirect LNG gas to regional pipelines. Maybe that's a little optimistic, but uh, <laughs> no impact as lower prices will derail LNG projects. <laughs> Uh, in Asia and Africa before the Middle East. And the last is um, no change as global economic growth will absorb all new supply. So that's your options. Middle East LNG exporters, how will they be impacted over the next decade, which is a 10-year outlook, uh, by the emergence of significant Asian uh, competition that Asian consumers can choose from? We heard our Chinese guests mention they're having happy days, so much choice now. Uh, but will these projects in East Africa actually emerge and will the US actually emerge as we talked about it might struggle under the new price so vote 10 seconds please No changes. Global economic growth will absorb all new supply. Uh, I suppose if global economic growth comes, comes back the oil price. And uh, as, as, as Narendra was saying, they, China, or India wants all energy from all sources all the time. And I think we heard the same from China. So 
that would be somewhat optimistic that the oil price would recover from that. So that's, uh, does anybody want to make a comment on that result? Well, First John? of all, East Africa shouldn't appear in that question because they're, they're, they're not going to be producing in the next decade. So if you're looking at Australasia and the US, um, then that can apply. Um, and I, the one thing you have to remember with all of the current uh, LNG projects that are being constructed now, that LNG has been sold to somebody already. Otherwise, those projects would not have got off the ground. <coughs> so. Uh, with three, um, will there be no changes? Economic growth will absorb all new supply. Well, that new supply has been sold to somebody. How they absorb it, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's definitely been sold, and it will be into the marketplace. Narendra, some yeah. closing comments? Yeah, just in my view, you see when we look at the price, uh, we are happy with oil prices going down and gas prices going down. But at the same time... Do you expect them to stay down just very quickly? At this level, for how long? Uh, maybe another three, four months, not more than that. I think beyond Easter, things will start changing. Okay. But just very uh, quickly, uh, for us, we look at it, the oil price, if it's in the region of $68 per barrel, that's probably more sustainable. Gas price, again, more or less, you know, something linked to that. But what is more important is that if prices are so low that it leads to social disruptions in the Middle East, then countries like India and China, Japan, Korea will actually be paying much higher price in time to come. So we need a price which makes sure that Middle East is socially stable. If that means $68, so be it. If that means $70, so be it. Because we have a vested interest in a price which makes sure that the social, uh, Middle East remains socially stable. Let's have some closing comments. Yeah, with this uh, uh, question, I think the common wisdom in the industry in the last, I don't know, five, four years is that we have a limitless demand in Asia. I think with the current dynamics we've seen lately, uh, pipeline gas from Russia to China, uh, maybe reinstating some of the nuclear uh, reactors in, in Japan, and with the emerging uh, additional supplies coming from Australia, that might have an impact. So uh, if, I'm in a, if I'm a big LNG supplier, then I, will, I might revisit uh, uh, our strategy in terms of, uh, of uh, contracts. Aldo, closing thoughts. Well, look, I, I agree Particularly with Particularly in America, what do you think the outlook for American LNG exports are? For American LNG, mm -hmm. I... Uh, Look, again, in the previous price environment, um, we saw many people um, over enthusiastic and many companies proposing many projects. Many of them are still under study. Almost, I mean, except for one, like I said, no construction had been started. This is an industry that goes through its uh, episodes of, uh, of uh, over enthusiasm and then goes in the opposite uh, extreme. I think we should not be swayed by but what I still see as uh, a process of adjustment to this new structural reality that Narendra has uh, emphasized. And, uh, and it seems to me that um, in any event, many of the investments that have been made, that already have been committed, that already have uh, consumers, will be serving pretty much of the market that we're seeing, which is why all this additional North American capacity for LNG export uh, why, we doubted that it was going to materialize, and we now may have more time to... You more doubt it now. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Double doubt. Okay, well, that seems like a place to conclude our session. <laughs> I want to thank our panelists for their contribution and insights onto this subject. If you would join me, please. Uh,